What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your weekly look at what's going in pop culture. I'm with my co-host Dave Martinson. Dave, what's going on, man? How's it going, man? Self-partnered over here, just like Emma Watson. <laughs> we chilling. How's it going? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. I, I wanted to give you some quick props. I thought you did a nice job giving your, your thoughts on The King, which we'll be talking about a little bit more in depth today. But check out that breakout review on our YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash nostalgia pod. We got music, TV, and movies to talk about today. And we're going to be starting with Earl Sweatshirt, um, a guy we were just talking about and giving a lot of praise to uh, late last year um, when he he dropped probably one of the most unique albums of why well, I guess it's last year maybe this year because it was it was so late you know mm-hmm. um, with some rap songs uh, got a lot of a lot of praise um, back with feet of clay short EP I think only like seven or eight songs. What did you, how did you feel about this the CP Dave? How, are you is, do you feel like this is a continuation of some rap songs or a bit of a different move for Earl? Yeah, so the story about this EP is this is the first body of work Earl has recorded completely after the death of his father last year. He definitely got into the death of his dad on some rap songs. This is the first thing fully informed of that. And in the lyrical content, you can pick up on his dad being a theme still and uh things left unsaid stuff like that um he was pretty estranged from his dad he died in south africa um but i think sonically it's very similar to some rap songs because mm-hmm. this shit's very dense lo-fi um emotionally Choppy. dark you know mm-hmm. it's uh, a lot like like that and i think this earl that's just kind of the way he's progressed as a conscious rapper he's always been a technical rapper but now it's funny he almost delivers more lethargic uh, line readings now, which is kind of interesting because we know he's proficient as a rapper, but sometimes it feels like he's so apathetic to what he's saying that it's he's just like barely rapping it. Um, so I find that, find that was an interesting choice. But yeah, thematically, it's very similar to some rap songs, and I kind of think about it in the same way. Uh, largely self-produced. Uh, I think the best beat actually was the Alchemist beat. But yeah, um, more, more, more of some rap songs. You, you, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these ideas might have been like b-sides from that album but um yeah it's, it's kind of more of this current earl we're, we're we're used to yeah i agree it feels in line maybe not as sharp or as refined as a lot of the um the songs on some rap songs but i still think there's a lot here to like and honestly just the, the way that these songs are, are cut and chopped and produced together is, is still very impressive um you know, a, a couple of songs stood out to me in particular. Um, El Toro Combo Meal, I thought, mm-hmm. was an absolute heater. Um, I thought Mavi actually added a lot to that track. And then uh, I also really liked M Tomb and 4N. Um, I thought those were just the ones that probably uh, popped off most to me. But overall, it's pretty, uh, just like some rap songs, very cohesive album that flows together and runs quick. I think it's only like 15 minutes yeah 15 minutes yeah four ends the only track that's like beyond two minutes too um it's kind of surprised to see that but i think that the first two tracks i enjoyed a lot too 74 and east uh again short tracks so like minute 50 but um it's just kind of that distillation of what earl is right now and again uh, you have to have to be in the mood to want to listen to this kind of music uh you know he's the time the guys he like likes to big up right now like Ka and Mike and standing on the corner all these guys they don't make the most uh accessible rap but if you're in that mood it's uh it's pretty compelling stuff absolutely um yeah I think this is definitely worth a listen if you enjoyed some rap songs you have have no brainer why uh, why you wouldn't listen to this makes no sense to me um well I'm gonna move on though to uh maybe more of a surprise than Earl is Gangstar coming out with their first album in what like <laughs> uh 16 years correct <laughs> the this it, first of all shout out to your hometown boston boys gangstar uh mc <laughs> guru and dj premier yeah um well, not really i mean 
Guru was from Boston and formed the original gangster in Boston, but yeah. then he moved to the city, New York City, and that's where he met Premier, who's not even from the city. So you, they're thought of as a New York act, even though neither of them is actually from New York. I always thought that was funny. They are Boston boys to me. Um, we're going to claim them. We, we need a win right now with Mookie Betts probably on the way out. Anyways. Um, you got Cousin Stiz, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gangstar, hip-hop duo. Uh, popular in the 90s. As I said, made their last album in 2003. The owners, they're back. with One of the best yet. Um, this may be one of the most surprising drops of the year just in ter- for me, just in terms of uh quality and how much this album just bangs like the whole thing um you know i i if you had told me in 2019 i might be putting a gangstar album on my top 10 (laughs) i probably would (laughs) have laughed at you so uh very surprised by that but seriously from start to finish i thought this album just went and i was totally with it how did you feel about one of the best yet yeah i i totally agree and which is so funny i mean obviously um, Guru is no longer with us. He passed away in uh, 2010. So this is inherently a posthumous record. Primo does not rap. He just makes the beats and composes the music. So this is all uh, f- fumbled together from about 30 unreleased recordings that Premier got uh, of Guru. I mean, they had, had a falling out too. And it's a very interesting story about how that happened and lawsuits. And was there a death? Bed letter about Guru not wine work with Premier in it or have his legacy influenced by Premier. Very interesting stuff. Um, quite complicated, but this is all came from unreleased, unreleased songs and hooks and unfinished ideas that Guru had made in like the mid to late aughts. And the fact that Premier made this album sound so good, and I think picked really good features to fill in the album. Uh, I think really just speaks to how uh, well, obviously talented Guru was that he can make stuff that would last, but also how talented an arranger that Premier is that, you know, 30 years in the game, he really just has the best year for this shit. Yeah, it, I think you, you hit on a great point. The, the features here that fill in the gaps are uh, just like top notch. I mean, Hitman with Q-Tip, um, yeah. oh. probably one of my favorite songs uh, on this record and yeah, it's going to sneaky be... Uh, Tr- trying to get in the, in the top 10 this year because I, I think Q-Tip just absolutely murders that song. He's fantastic. Um, I thought J. Cole was really, really good uh, on what was the track with him? Family and Loyalty. Yes, First Family single. and Loyalty. Uh, and, you know, J. Cole, we, we've been talking about his like feature run is like ridiculous right now. And yeah, I think it's getting historic. I was thinking about this the other day. I, I want to explore this more because it's just uh, unheard of, and I think, and, and Cole in particular on this track, um, obviously he spits a fire verse as he's been doing, but it really just fits the song. And you kind of get, it's like, oh man, this is like what we've always wanted Cole to be, which is mm-hmm. just an old school guy because he's an old head. It, it was honestly really great. And I think that was a perfect song to use as the lead single, the first Gangstar song in 16 years. Um, but then even like less than things, you got MOP on here. Uh, you got Royce mm-hmm. on here. Uh, you mentioned Q-Tip, Tal- Talib Kweli, Black Star fame, you know? I mean, really inspired all the way around. Um, even Neo, who I, I definitely raised an yeah. eyebrow out when I saw him on here, sounded good. Oh, and of course, Group Home, uh, speaking yep. of the 90s. So, yeah, I think it's, it's just funny because, I mean, the beats, are, the beats are great, as you expect. That's Premier. I mean, he's made some of the most iconic hip-hop beats, Jay-Z, Biggie, Nas, uh, Kanye, everybody, really. Um, and he's been active this whole time, but just to hear him really get back to like that real, real New York shit in 2019 is really cool because that real New York shit that everyone likes, um, when people make it, they usually stop making. Like Joey Battis doesn't make this shit anymore, right? And mm-hmm. I know what was what, last week everyone was celebrating uh, Futures, uh, what was it, his uh, famous uh, mixtape or sorry, sorry his Monster mixtapes five years old, finally on streaming. And I'm like, man, we got some real ass hip hop right now. Miss me with this future bullshit. There's a new Gangstar album out and it's fucking good. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's the thing really is uh, with hip hop evolving. I mean, we just had a Kanye album we talked about last week where he's moving into gospel and 
Kanye just in general, who was once such a uh, a mover of hip hop, seeming to almost be fading in terms of his popularity and cultural impact, um, to have this kind of come in and really inject some like old school, like classical '90s sounding hip hop was just like such a like breath of fresh air for the, the genre at this point. I mean, hip hop is never in in need of a star or something interesting happening. It's that's a monster in terms of stuff to talk about and just quality projects all the time. But um, this just seems so different than everything else we're listening to. And uh, you know, uh, one of the the tracks I, I really liked was uh, the the title track, one of the best yet, with the the big Shug interlude. And mm-hmm. I was like, man, this is like this embodies that like classic '90s sound with like like the uh, the interview from a radio thing leading into like just a fire song in general. I was like. Phew. This is right. this is it right here. Yeah, I think when I heard the second single, "Bad Name," where um, it starts off, uh, "We're the God of Big and Pac, we're still here. None of these weirdos would act so cavalier." Like, obviously, really good wordplay, but also as you listen to the rest of that song, it's like, wow, that that obviously was recorded ten years ago, but and is referring to Bling Rap in particular, but it's still obviously very analogous today with mumble rap and SoundCloud rap and all that stuff. And I was like, man, that's like an old head anthem that just we just that just came out. Really cool. Yeah, absolutely. What other songs stood out to you on here? Uh, yeah, those. Are the, I mean, I think you hit, you hit a bunch of the other ones. I really like the, the two singles, as I said. The Q-tip performance is really great. Um, but yeah, I think overall, it just it, it flows really well. And I mean, it's it's a lot of tracks, but only thirty seven minutes. Um, yep. And I guess that would make sense considering a lot of these tracks are pretty short because again, none of these were finished songs when Premiere got them. Uh, but I mean, I mean, the shorter list would be what didn't I like? I mean, to, <laughs> I, I, I don't really know. I mean, like I, I probably won't listen to the interludes again, but I think everything else was, there's, I think there was something to uh, enjoy about just about every track, which is uh, rare in any genre. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I think it'd be, it'd be a lot easier just to name what we didn't like than what we did. However, a couple of the songs that I thought really stood out lights out, um, I already mentioned Hitman and from a distance um, had just so many like nice little flourishes. I feel like that's really where you can hear like Premier really just like falling out where he, you mm-hmm. know, changes up from the keys to the strings, but keeping the same beat with all of it. It's so like well produced and it sounds so like glossy and finished to go from Earl to this. It's like so sure. So contrast in terms of like the, the definition of the, the production. So um, definitely check out this Gangstar album probably one of the best of the year um we're, we're gonna be talking about it more i think yeah. one of the best yet you could say <laughs> why don't we talk about his dark materials now hbo's newest uh major ip shows um based off the novel series by philip pullman premiered last night uh, mondays i mean this is a pretty killer cla- killer cast uh daphne mm-hmm. keen for logan headlining yeah. it um which i mean she was fantastic in logan so i'm glad we get to see her doing some more here i mean only 14 still still very young yeah uh her and the the um, kids from stranger things are really dominating that that young kid space i feel like yeah for Especially sure if this goes well um but i mean then you got uh james mcavoy mm-hmm. you have lin-manuel miranda um and I mean, a lot of people that you recognize, but if you person from the affair shows, what's yeah, person from the affair, you have uh, Ruth Freeman Wilson. from the wire. Um, just a lot of uh, like those guys were just really solid right. quality actors. To Veterans. Be cast. Exactly. Um, so it's interesting because it's an eight episode series um, premiered last night uh, with, with BB, uh, the BBC premiering it on November 3rd. Um, and I, I didn't read the books. I don't think you did either. And I was left very intrigued, but also just kind of like, did it any, like, it felt like a lot happened and nothing happened at the same time in the episode for me. And mm-hmm. I was like, I, I don't know if this is going to be something that's going to be able to grab my attention, my attention the whole time. If it just keeps giving us these little nuggets, I have to imagine it's going to have to pick up here pretty quickly. How'd you feel about the premiere? Yeah. Um, I'm going to use the W word here. Got some West World vibes no. in terms of the concerns I had. Again, after just one episode, but 
with a pilot of this magnitude, obviously adapting a, a famous source material with fervent fans, fans that have been burned before with the 2007 movie, The Golden Compass, a movie I've seen, but recall very little of. Um, you ha- the expectations are inherently high. And it seemed like this pilot was most concerned with really just building the world, which makes sense because there's a lot, of, a lot, a lot to do with that. Um, I think they did a good job of explaining how everyone has the manifestation of their soul in this demon form, which is a animal that'll uh, manifest as an animal that will change until you come of age or hit puberty, and then it settles on a form. Um, all kinds of animals, and they like to talk to you. So I think that was cool, and I thought those effects looked pretty good. But mm-hmm. the other world building, like with the college and um, what's it called, the, uh, the the authority that like rules the land. I forget who's an M. Um, mm-hmm. There's just a lot of questions about how the rule world works and like what what stuff means and like when McAvoy's showing off this uh, dust stuff to his colleagues, they're all like freaking out and saying it's heresy. And we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't get anything. And I I know it's going to come, but it's like Lyra, Daphne Keene's character gets told a bunch in this episode, uh, like, Oh, you, you, you can't ask this or you're too young and you'll learn later. And it's like, well, well us as the audience would also like to know these things. So (laughs) you have to tell it in a compelling way to build up a mystery. So that's just my concern off the pilot, but I think the obviously going in knowing that this is a store people ride for, I'm going to give it more of a benefit of a doubt. Mm-hmm. And it, we know HBO and the BBC are investing in this. They've already greenlit a second season. Um, I believe they're actually shooting that right now. Like that's like this is in the pipe. This is part of that post Thrones HBO uh, blockbuster lineup, or so they hope. Um, but yeah, I think there was there, there's there's room for room for improvement in terms of the storytelling. But I think everything else was pretty interesting, as you said. Yeah, it's. I found the scenes that were most fascinating to be when uh, Daphne King gets to interact with somebody, whether it was when she like tricked her teacher, um, or when the the scene where her and McAvoy finally interact. I thought were absolutely like uh, just gripping. I really liked seeing her get to interact with other people, but I feel like it's a lot of time with her being um, like almost like being alone, trying to like contemplate things or people like talking at her. Um, but I'm really intrigued by the, the animal portion of this, you know, especially because game, uh, game of Thrones, you know, obviously we couldn't have ghosts in the last two seasons, but we could have drag. So now we're going to have basically a version of ghost, if not bigger every single episode for eight episodes and maybe beyond it's uh, right bit puzzling but i think it's a nice flourish and really add some uh some intrigue to it especially um with the the uh, subtle hints that daphne is this this part of this prophecy and this incredibly strong Mm -hmm. being in this world and what her demon will become i think is very intriguing um you know it's interesting because even on the the picture behind you um, Lin Man, Lin Manuel Miranda is mentioned in this. However, he's not one of the stars of this. He's listed as a reoccurring character. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, I feel like it's a bit of like a here's like the the big star who's attached to this, but really not going to be as maybe involved as people may believe. Um, but there's enough here where I'm like, I want I want to see more. Going to probably I mean I'm going to watch the whole thing regardless, especially if it's a train wreck. It could be fun to talk about, but. <laughs> um, I, I have I have faith that they'll turn this around. Um, what did you think of the kid who played? Was it Roger or is it? Yeah, Roger, the friend. He the kid who got taken. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's he, that's the thing with kid actors, man. Yeah. They're uh usually bad. And but the thing is, you put it, you put him next to Daphne Keene. Right. It's like she's such a talent. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, um <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I like the scene where um that I I still don't know the character names when when uh that kid's like having his come of age and he, he finds out his demon's a hawk. Um mm-hmm. and like oh, the the whole the whole town's like cheering him on and like mad hyped. I was like, that's cool. Some mm-hmm. some some <laughs> some ritual shit. But um I'm curious to see, like, so the, the critics, they've seen four episodes. They've seen half the season. Lynn Manuel shows up in that fourth episode. Um, I'm curious to see how far they go with 
this uh, the authority that like rules the land because in the books that is seen at widely seen as a stand-in for the issues with religion when it goes too far and authority and stuff like that and the movie was famously uh, picketed and protested by religious groups for being anti Christianity and stuff like that and I'm just curious to see how far that goes I mean because of that, that's interesting right that and I feel like if you pull back and they're just a nebulous uh bad fascist uh government that needs to be overthrown it's just not unique anymore so I really hope they they stick to some of those things that kind of stood out and, and enhance the themes that all the fans of the series really rode for. But that remains to be seen. Yeah, it's, you know, like you said, there's enough here to be intrigued, but also I think enough here to be concerned about as well. So um, we'll definitely be watching. Uh, I'm also very curious to see um, Ruth Wilson's character, Marissa Coulter, Ms. Coulter, um, mm-hmm. Uh, getting some weird, weird vibes from her in this episode but every time she was on screen i was like ah, she she at least catches my eye you know it seems like she's an actress in, in a role that's going to be quite intriguing it's like she's dressed differently than everyone pay attention <laughs> good trick yeah <laughs> uh shout out to the, the costume department there any last <laughs> thoughts on this I, I know we'll probably be wrapping up the the season in right around christmas time yeah, yeah, it's kind of annoying. It's like, man, can this be earlier for my year-end list work? I like the shows to be done already. And then Netflix is like, now nah, we're dropping The Witcher on the 20th. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's going to be tough. But this one, I mean, unless it's really, really good, TV this year is just yeah, so no, deep. Yeah, exactly. It's not, not that big a deal. Yeah. Um, why don't we jump to something that you already talked about, but I wanted to kind of give some thoughts on the king uh uh netflix timothy chalamet man um so yeah the king interesting film we were uh we were very hyped for it you know to uh timothy chalamet we we ride for him we stand for him a bit robert pattinson uh joel edgerton we stand for all these guys right Mm -hmm. um and then and then the king comes and (laughs) You know how I feel about, um, you know how I feel about this period of time for movies. Not not a big uh, knights, not a big mm. medieval times right. guy over here. Outlaw you King, know, I, you 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 were I, Luke Warm on. Yeah, um, I'm very very lukewarm on. Although, uh, shout out to Chris Pine winning the Chris Wars, probably. And anyways, uh, I, I was impressed by the king and from a technical standpoint i thought it looked really good i thought chalamet did a pretty good job just kind of playing this very like brooding like young 20s person thrust into a situation he reviled but i've never seen a movie with so many talented people simultaneously give them too much time and not enough time if that makes sense like joel edgerton i feel like embodies that perfectly where he's on screen and when he gets to have dialogue and gets to interact with with henry i think he's great but a lot of time he's just there and just like yep joel edgerton looking like uh little john over here and then uh (laughs) then the the scene ends and i'm just like all right uh what's the point of that Mm -hmm. robert pattinson shows up for maybe like what five scenes if that yeah Every time he talks, he's electric, but we can't get more of him on screen. Just uh, big, so big balls with your little pee pee. <laughs> <laughs> best part of the movie. <laughs> I mean, by, by far the best part of the movie. That and when he, he finally rides down and, and wants to, to bite him and slides in the mud. But, mm-hmm. man, I don't know. It, it was a bit of a, a disappointment only because I, I think our expectations for this going in were really high and just overall um an inconsistent film and especially from the beginning it, it, you're just kind of like all right this this dude's brooding he's not very happy and obviously doesn't want to be in the situation but it never it feels like it never resolves like he just basically is like 
just never lie to me by the end. Like, I'm going to figure this out. So it's a detective film in a way by, by the end. So. <laughs> I don't know. Also, I was a little disappointed that uh, Sean Harris, you know, I, I literally had the thought in my head. I wrote down my notes like, hmm. man, I'm glad this guy finally did, wasn't the bad guy. But nope. In the end, fucking bad guy. Did you did you know that was coming? No, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with the uh, the Henry ad, the uh, yeah. trio of Shakespeare fill uh, uh, plays. This is based off of. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know about this, this this character, but yeah, I thought the same thing because Sean Harris obviously really effective as a villain in the last two Mission Possible movies, among other things. Mm-hmm. And then half of be yeah, I was like, oh, he's an ally, interesting, showing off the talent. And then he's like, no, he's the master. <laughs> manipulator all along classic (sighs) it's so disappointing i mean you have uh, just uh, these six actors i mean chalamet but joel edgerton robert pattinson lily rose depp ben mendelson sean harrison thomas and mckenzie how uh, how many of them would you say were used to their full potential in this movie um i mean in a sense you could say none i think i thought chalamet acquitted himself pretty well yeah um not my favorite role of his. I think that's partially due to the way the character was written for this, though. Yep. Um, I agree. Generally, not not that having the best time, and even when he has a moment where he like he tries to save Tommen from death on the field, it somehow yeah. didn't come across as that noble. I think as it was supposed to meant. That's just the way it was written. But I, I like Timmy, and I think the uh, the battle speech scene, and when he starts to lose it a little bit once he's in power, you know, he's making the most of what he can and Pattinson again we want to way more scenes but really you know kind of leaps off the page due to the showiness of uh, the Dauphi and the way that was written mm-hmm. but yeah Mendelssohn um doing his thing chewing scenery lovely I would want to listen to him just talk forever but obviously he's gone real fast and Thomas and Mackenzie is just a throwaway right mm-hmm. as the sister Lily Rose Depp I thought she was in the movie way more given the promo didn't know she comes in literally for like the epilogue you know right um I, li- I like the guy who played um uh henry hotspur but he dies in like 10 minutes <laughs> so yeah it's yeah. uh I, like i said in the in the non-spoiler review which you can check out on youtube.com slash nostalgia pod i think just structurally the movie should have been just reworked like before you know it we're in france in the hundred years war if you know the history but why exactly why did Chalamet decide like he, he felt slighted and he got manipulated, even though it seemed like he had more peaceful intentions in mind. Just a bit of a miss, I think, from the way the movie was made, which is disappointing given all the talent, as we've said. Yeah. Wh- one, one thing about Mendelssohn, right? Uh, just a uh, amazing actor who has played a great villain most of the time, except for in Captain Marvel, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but he does so much with uh, his non-dialogue, just his, his non-verbals on the screen. And I feel like he's basically shaded. In the, like, it's just dark the entire movie. Yes. I get it. The period is great. But like, I, I was like, is this Ben Mendelsohn in the first scene? Because I was like, it sounds like him. He's got the little list. But like, I can't even tell. It's so fucking dark. Yeah, one, one thing I wrote in my notes, I haven't verified this, but I was wondering if they just shot this with a lot of natural light. Like a lot of this stuff yeah. inside the castle, it just looked dark. Like it was mainly lit by the torches you're seeing. And I, I just doubt that's actually the case, but it came across that way. Yeah. Um, also, I, I, given that a lot of the promo involved Henry fighting or at war, I thought there was going to be more action. Like I'm, I just reflect yeah. again on Outlaw King, which I find as a very interesting analog to this because they're, these are both movies that at premiere festivals had mixed receptions. They both culminate in a final battle that involves winning the upper hand against a superior force using uh, a muddy field. Mm-hmm. Like re- really specifically similar. Um, yet I thought Outlaw King was just way more thrilling mm-hmm. um, as a film. Um, and I definitely like that one more. Um, but what do you think of uh, the, the Battle of Agincourt? Like very, very Battle of the Bastards, um, half brother esque. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. the the bastard of the Battle of the Bastards in a certain sense. Uh, I thought that was really well done. Um, and something about those scenes, especially like the claustrophobia of like the way it was shot and just being like in the middle of the battle, I thought was really, really cool. Um, 
yeah and i thought chalamet the the fight um choreography was fantastic you know he has a little hatchet he's going around with right. um and also i i think he does a really good job of portraying like the agony of like watching like his men get killed while you have to like wait until you know everybody's in there so to speak what what his friend right. told him um i thought that was great i thought most of the action scenes this were great even like the the fight where it's one-on-one combat to you know uh, save the other the people from having to fight right. uh, even that though was it good. wasn't maybe like the flashiest fight scene i thought it was probably one of the most realistic but still like yeah. enthralling um which yeah. I, I i appreciated that yeah between this and then obviously when the dolphin meets his end this does a good job of showing the the folly of fighting in full suits of armor you know i i did appreciate yeah. that realism i was also disappointed in uh, nicholas bertel's score you know obviously kind of the wonder kid of scores these days but there's really only like one or two times where i thought the score was noticeable um mm-hmm. so that, that was disappointing yeah um quick quick thought or a quick question for you so chalamet on deck got little women gonna be coming out soon but really playing a you know a supporting role in that wes anderson film not named or really French much dispatch. Information about that. it's named oh, so. okay we have a name um we don't know what his role will be in that. And then nope. Dune on the horizon. Yes. No? Yeah. And Dune, he's the lead in Dune, yes, with Denny. Yeah. So, I mean, how are we feeling about him right now? Because this time last year, we would have been like, Stude's, you know, the, the world is his. And then I think recently we've been like, eh, maybe, maybe not. No, no, I'm feeling good, man. He's still 23. Um, yeah. And he's kind of doing the patents and game plan. He's just younger. He's working with everybody. Denny Villeneuve, Wes Anderson, Greta Gerwig multiple times, Luca Guadagnino. Um, he's working with tons of talent. Even David Michaud, who made this movie, has made some good films in the past, like The Rover and Animal Kingdom. Um, he continues to make, I think, interesting choices. And while this was probably intended to be more prestige than it ended up being, again, like Outlaw King, uh, the diversity of his roles, I think, continues to stand out, both supporting stuff where he can kind of like steal scenes, like Lady Bird and we assume Little Women. Um, and then obviously we'll see what, see what happens with Dune. That's, that's, I think, an inspired thing to attempt to get on a bigger scale, but still making an artistic choice because you're working with fucking Denny Villeneuve, of all people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm I feel good, you know. I think um, again, he's still not a household name in the traditional sense. He's still more internet famous, uh, you know, stand crazy famous than anything else. But the film film heads know who he is, and I think like his talent. And yes, I think Beautiful Boy was ended up being a much more mixed reception than we anticipated when we first saw the movie. But I mean, the stock is still really high. So I, yeah, I'm not really concerned, you know. I mean, again, he has three high-profile movies coming out in the next thirteen months. Yep. So, let's let's wait till the next thirteen months before we can really prognosticate anything negative. You know? Yeah, and I, I don't think Beautiful Boy was, uh, you know, the lack of reception on it was anything about Shalabay. Um, You know, his role maybe was not not the showiest because he's playing a, a drug drug addict in, in and out of of treatment and sobriety. But uh, I, I agree. I I'm most excited for the uh, the, the follow up to Tenet, uh, which I'm almost uh, I, I'll call right now will be a Timothy Chalamet led Christopher Nolan film in the future. So cool. that that's what I'm really looking forward to, <laughs> um, and that that that'll be his like projection to fame role, hopefully. But uh, yeah, no Chalamet, I, I think continue to buy the stock, and if other people are selling, buy more of it, because um, the King still very I thought his performance was still very good. Um, I'm going to let you kind of choose where you want to go next, Dave. Motherless Brooklyn or Marriage Story? Let's start with Motherless Brooklyn. Um, Ooh, the Ed Norton film. Yes. So Motherless Brooklyn, as you said, stars Ed Norton, written by Ed Norton, directed by Nor- Ed Norton. Uh, he also got it, got, it, got it financed. He basically did everything. And this is a movie that's an adaptation of the Jonathan uh, Lethem novel from 1999 about a detective who has Tourette syndrome. But the key thing that Edward Norton did to change this movie is rather than having this take place in the 90s, 
takes place in 1957, uh, which is a obviously a very deliberate thing to do when you're changing the story. And I had not read the book, um, but w- by changing it to the 50s in New York, he's basically made a neo-noir movie and it's shot and told in that way. And I just really appreciate this movie because it's just kind of a throwback in that in that regard. There's a little bit of narration at the beginning and the end, you know, and it, you just kind of get that old school hard boiled detective feel, which I think is really um, fun just because it's pretty rare. Um, also, by going back to 1950s New York, you get to add a, I think, a new element, which was really smart and it really informs the story. That would be Alec Baldwin's character, who is called Moses Randolph in the movie, but it's a clear uh, analog for Robert Moses, who, as people know, is the grand builder of modern day New York City, but also notorious for, you know, ravaging the Bronx and taking down uh, neighborhoods in corrupt and uh, institutional racist fashion. Yes. There you go. And, and the movie uh, tackles that, I think, in a smart way. And you can certainly draw parallels till today, post-2016 U.S. in New York, but uh, Norton has maintained that he actually had this script uh, written as of like 2012, and he'd been trying to make this movie for about 20 years. And you can understand the studio's um, uh, lack of interest in financing something so old school, so traditional, but he was able to get this across the finish line, which I think was just really admirable in general. That's why I really hope people would support it. But you know, it only cost $26 million. I think for $26 million, man, this looks really good. It really looks like old school New York. Um, the production design's great. The, the costumes are good. Um, but it only made $3.5 million in like 1,300 theaters last week. So mm. no one's seeing it, which I guess isn't a, isn't a surprise. If people are going to see a New York movie, they're seeing Joker. So, you know. Um, yeah. But I mean, to that point, uh, he got a, a stacked ass cast to fill out this story. And, and he actually said they all worked at scale to help keep the costs down, which is uh, obviously really nice. So he, Alec Baldwin, as I mentioned, uh, Willem Dafoe, Bobby Cannavale, Michael K. Williams, Leslie Mann, Jerry Jones, uh, Gugu Mbatara, stacked cast. And they're all really good. Some yeah. of them have bigger roles than others. But uh, I really liked the story. I thought it was really compelling. And Probably the most important thing that needs to be successful with Mother West Brooklyn is that Ed Norton, playing a character who has Tourette's, Ed Norton, someone who does not have Tourette's, that needs to be done in a, a uh, certain way. And the movie does not use the Tourette's as like a punchline or a joke, but I think the movie's kind of teaching you about more empathy. And I think Norton actually mentioned that one of the other reasons he wanted to take the movie back 40 years was that in the story and in the movie as well, uh, his character Lionel is referred to by his friends and his colleagues as like freak show sometimes because obviously mm. he has threats and he has certain ticks and people just don't really act that way even in the nineties. You know, people know what Tourette's is by then and you know are, are cool with it and, and and just nicer about it, right? So it made more sense, I think, to make the movie take place farther in the past. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think one of the thing it's funny it has a uh, a like a specific like a 50 something, a 60 something on Rotten Tomatoes, which uh, really killed any awards hope it had when it premiered at Telluride. But a lot of the, the reviews are really focusing on the length. The movie is two, two hours and 20 minutes long. It's really long. And it could, it could have been trimmed a little bit, but I really enjoy just kind of being back in like mm-hmm. old school New York. So I thought the movie was, uh, I, think, I, think, I think it paid off well. I liked how it ended and performances are so good that I would certainly recommend people check this out once it, hit streaming it probably will not last in the theaters too much longer given the lack of success but yeah Brooklyn, loveless brooklyn uh, good time it, you know this is his first time directing since what 2000 with keeping the faith so long time it seems like uh from what you're describing uh maybe a little more time in the editing room could have helped it out but otherwise uh pretty solid showing for our guy ed norton uh jack from Fight Club, my, my yes. favorite role of his probably. I mean, what would be your favorite role for him? In? <laughs> Clearly, uh, Bru- uh, Bruce Banner. Oh wait, Incredible Hulk, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, American History X is really great. Uh, to have to yeah. call that a favorite role, considering that movie is uh, <laughs> agonizing to watch and rewatch. I did rewatch some of it on YouTube the other day. Um, He's really good in Rounders too. Yep, Rounders is yeah. awesome. As um, yep. what's his name? In Rounders? Yeah, his great name. Rounders, what is uh, it? Lester. Worm. 
Worm. Worm. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, was it uh, Primal Fear? Cape Fear? Cape Fear. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Ed Norton is, is awesome. And yeah. he's really good in this. He's also really good in Moonrise Kingdom. Um, yes. As a leader. Uh, this is like Boy the Scout, Scout leader. leader. Yeah. I really like that one. Uh, also, Alita Battle Angel last year as Nova. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. while we uh, while we move on to Marriage Story, <laughs> Noah Baumbach's new film. Actually, Lead to Battle Angel was this year. I already forgot. <laughs> was it really <laughs> February? Oh, <my> God. <clears throat> those like those early year dumps are. Uh, oof. Mm-hmm. Anyways, <laughs> uh, mother or uh, not motherless Brooklyn Marriage Story. Noah Baumbach, Dave. This is this is a film that's getting a lot of. Awards buzz, Adam Driver seems like he might be uh, on the fast track to a nomination for this film, but it's not even in limited release yet, and you got a chance to go see this. Tell me, should I be as excited as I am for this movie? Hell yeah, man. Uh, So I was lucky enough to see this movie uh, at the end of last week due to the uh, Independent Film Festival of Boston, their fall focus. They were showing a bunch of movies, and Marriage Story jumped out to me because I got to see it well in advance. Um, It's just starting its limited theatrical run uh, tomorrow. That's six theaters in New York and L.A., so very limited uh, exposure to anyone, of course. Like all the other Netflix releases, not going to be in the major theater chains during the limited theatrical run. And then it'll be on Netflix on December 6th, so not too long, a month ago. Um, but as you mentioned, this movie's got a lot of acclaim ever since it debuted at Venice. And I believe it's like 97% on RT, over 100 reviews. Everyone's loving it. And Noah Baumbach, obviously, is pretty respected in the filmmaking community. Um, both his solo work, his co-writes with Wes Anderson, his work with his partner, Greta Gerwig. Um, people know Noah Baumbach, but... This is an incredibly personal movie and, you know, reading more about it, um, it's certainly informed by his actual divorce with Jennifer Jason Lee, who he shared the child with. And this movie is about the divorce of Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson's characters. And they play artists. Adam Driver is a kind of successful, kind of well-known in the community theater director in New York City. And mm-hmm. ScarJo is a actress who became well known early on for a role in like a, like a teen comedy and then became kind of the star of driver's uh, theater company. And they yeah. have a kid and they live in, I believe Brooklyn park slope. And the movie starts off in a really, uh, really funny way where they both are reading letters about what they like about each other for a uh, mediator regarding their uh-huh. divorce. And it's really funny because it's so positive and, what makes marriage story so excellent is that it, it really knows how to uh, jump around between stuff that's really, really funny and incredibly emotional, devastating stuff. And again, it's about divorce. It's about um, having a kid and, and making choices for that kid when you're trying to have a divorce and your happiness versus the happiness of your, your spouse, your partner. It's, um, the way it, it kind of moves scene to scene, I think is so masterful. And I've, I saw this at a, in a festival setting. It was a packed house. Every single laugh line fucking killed. Like the hundred percent of the, the crowd is laughing. And then when it, when it, when it's sad, when it's tough it's to sad. watch, like you hear sniffling, it, it, it's rough. And I think just from a screenplay perspective, it, it's something that is pretty simple to understand, right? People having a divorce and a divorce getting messy. Mm-hmm. simple concept but it's told so well and part of that of course is that uh the cast is great and the performances are it's incredible i mean scott johansson we just talked about her with jojo rabbit um really impressing in that role um i think this is the best she's ever been in wow. her story she really does a lot really shifting throughout her emotions and even though the movie ultimately focuses more on driver's perspective uh, Scarjo is fantastic, but Driver, I mean, we've talked him up just like everyone else because he's probably the actor of his generation at this point. Um, he's incredible. And again, he really knows, really juggles in this movie the various emotions and, and of course, having that inf- inform on his acting. Ultimately, I think that, like the, 
maybe not the standout scene, but the standout scene from them conveying emotion is this fight they have at his apartment. And it is the most gutting shit, like them just breaking each other down and tearing into each other. It's, 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 it's wild. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to spoil anything yet, but in short, it's a really, really impressive movie. And the supporting cast is great too. Laura Dern plays ScarJo's lawyer. Alan Alda and Ray Liotta play driver's lawyers. Oh, Alan yeah. Alda has Parkinson's now. So nice to see him still out there while he still can act. Um, Merritt Weaver plays ScarJo's sister. Cast is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And this one, this was the runner up for the Venice People's Choice Award. And then it got three nominations at the Gotham's. And obviously, nothing else has happened yet. But yeah, this will be a Best Picture nomination. This will be a Best Actor nomination for Driver. And I think ScarJo probably also gets in for Best Actress as well. And that's deserving. I think screenplays wow. are right there wow. too. Bond back is one for. Screenplay before with Squid and the Whale, so that wouldn't surprise me either. So this is this is Netflix. This is their uh, this is their golden goose for Oscars and for good reason. The movie's great. Yeah, I was just about to say that. What a win for Netflix. I mean, back to back years having films that are going to get uh, best act actress, uh, possibly you know back to back years best actress for best film or best uh, picture nominations is a huge win for them. Um, uh, although I do have to say, you know, just uh, a thought I was having as you were talking, I was talking about Motherless Brooklyn and how little money it made. Almost, uh, <laughs> almost makes me feel kind of sad because I feel like uh, Netflix. I mean, I don't know what the budget was for this, but I can't imagine having this kind of cast. It was uh, relatively small, um, and I feel like this is going to kind of keep pushing to those polars in terms of like the big budget films or small but without the cgi maybe it wasn't that big actually yeah Talking probably not. i don't think it was that expensive behind the salaries <laughs> yeah um but yeah netflix killing it man um they had the king yeah but this marriage story sounds like it's going to be a hit can't wait although thinking about the the range of emotions of it i almost like a pit in my stomach already thinking about that that scene in their apartment I like almost like just want to skip past it uh Oof, can't wait to watch. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, no, man. It's uh, it's really great, and I think uh, you know, Bombback in a certain sense <clears throat> actually helped shepherd Netflix into this true prestige era two years ago in 2017 with the Meyerowitz stories. That and mm-hmm. of course Bong's Okja were the first Netflix movies to compete at Con or at least be shown at Con, and that kind of really got this new wave of Netflix really investing in. Uh, excellent films and this is not their only one they also have the two popes coming soon yeah uh, but yeah this um this is something do you have do you have a favorite bomb back movie i haven't seen most of his movies i mean debut with kicking and screaming in the 90s um well known for francis ha uh, mistress america meyerowitz of course 2017 Any, anything uh, anything that jumps out to you greenberg um no, you know, let, let, let me just take a look through through uh you know i really like the meyerwitz stories thought that was pretty good um haven't seen francis ha no none of these really stand out i guess fantastic mr fox but well he's just a voice in that right that's a voice he Anderson. co-wrote it though he co-wrote okay. that in life aquatic for what yeah life aquatic i guess maybe that maybe that would be it yeah francis ha and mistress america he co-wrote with greta gerwig who he is now as a child with as well so uh, that family's doing really well this year, given the Little Women reactions we've gotten so far. <laughs> yeah, sounds like they're actually going to be going against each other for uh, Best Picture. Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> very interesting. Like when uh, uh, when Cameron and Bigelow went up against each other, uh, ex, yeah, ex, ex-spouses. <laughs> I was going to say ex-spouses at that point. At least they're together. So, <laughs> um, Either way, uh, can't wait to watch Marriage Story. What should uh, the people be watching for next week, though, Dave? Uh, yeah, next week. Where do I wrote this shit down somewhere? Uh, somewhere. Next week we oh. have the FKA Twigs album, which was pushed back a little bit, really? but now it's coming for real, for real. Um, I'm interested to see what it sounds like. We also have the Doja Cat sophomore album. I'm excited as fuck for that juicy banger song. So we'll be talking about that for sure. Um. We also have The Mandalorian, 
debuting on Tuesday when Disney Plus goes live. Scared of the future while I hop in the Mandalorian. Exactly. Um, movie front Midway from Roland Emmerich about the Battle of Midway in World War II. I'm most interested in that just because that movie cost $100 million but was financed independently. Interesting story there. And also Last Christmas, mm. Amelia Clark and Henry Golding. Um, oh, that looks Chris pretty good from the trailer. I'm already? interested. So, yeah. yeah. Ooh, was... I'm down to go. I- I'm down to watch it. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what, what I get to oh. this week. But I'm, I'm very intrigued by Chris. Also, The End of the Fucking World just premiered on Netflix, I believe, today. Season 2. So we'll be talking about that as well because we really like Season 1, which came out last year. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'll get through the whole season, but maybe we can do like a mid-season and then a, right. a full season. I think it's only going to be like necessary. four hours total, right? Those are half-hour yeah. episodes, if I remember right. That's true. Maybe, maybe I will get around to it. We'll see. But uh, either way, definitely check that out and more and follow us, soundcloud.com slash nostalgiapod. Um, give us a YouTube subscription and also go to Twitter at nostalgiapod to catch all the news that we aren't talking about on here. Uh, and also, if you're listening to us live or on Tuesday and you can go vote it's your civic duty. All right. Peace out.